Uh, hello, everybody. So we about to start um, start introduction to the text analytics for social media chatter talk with Nabanita Roy. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. Nabanita. Na, na na Sorry. Is the scientist at AC Worldwide. Uh, she's a blogger at Medium, a famous blog. To be honest, and you are AI lead in education in AI Ireland. Is it right? Yeah, yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Um, so uh, you gotta speak a bit closer to microphone. Is this audible? Yeah. Cool. Uh, so my name is Nabanita Roy, uh, <laughs> um, and I'm a data scientist at ACI Worldwide, um, and the education lead in women in AI Ireland. Um, I'll be talking about text analytics, natural language processing, social media, all these things uh, this evening. My love for natural language processing basically took me to Dublin, and um, that's where I reside, and um, pursue my degree in data science, did my thesis in NLP. And even though I've been working with uh, three companies or fintech companies, uh, my basic work as a data scientist has been about NLP, and it's something that I enjoy and explore during my free time. So that's why I have this talk, and most of my talks are about social me um, about text analytics. So uh, in today's agenda, I will be talking. I'll be starting from scratch about natural language processing, what it is, what is social media. Why, uh, what are the applications which are uh, available uh, in different uh, industries for why should companies invest in social media analysis? Uh, traditional NLP, like um, how it has been in the old days, how it has changed because of social media texts, they're different. Um, and what are the challenges associated and how the, how the NLP techniques have changed from what it was to what researchers, researchers are going towards. Um, so starting with natural language processing, what it is, uh, when we, um, if for, because I, um, I basically speak Hindi, Bengali, Indian languages, and uh, when I went to take the IELTS exam, which is a famous English uh, testing uh, framework, I was tested upon reading, listening, writing, and speaking skills. And exactly these four different components are important for machines to learn uh, in, in order to be able to interact like humans do. So that's all about natural language processing, enabling machines to read, write, speak, and listen like humans do. Um, it is a combination because we're talking about languages. It is a combination of linguistics, cognitive science, so understanding what's going on, um, statistics, so uh, quantitatively, quantitatively express what you what you understand in terms of texts and natural languages, expressing them as numbers in order for your machines to interpret them, and many other things under the hood of AI, um, and then. Basically, if you've heard about the Turing test uh, for AI, you would be, as a machine, if it's you know, someone beyond the wall, as, as a listener or an, as, as, a, as someone who's interacting, should not be able to distinguish if the, if the thing beyond the wall is a machine or a human. So these are the, this is a primer on natural language processing, what it is. And, it, it can broadly be classified into two uh, different subtasks. One is uh, natural language understanding, and the other one is natural language generation. So when you talk about understanding, it's about listening and your reading skills, com comprehending what the other person or thing is talking to you about, uh, building your opinions, understanding uh, what, are the, what are the things that that uh, person or a machine is talking about, um, extracting, say, entities from it? Or is it in the past, in the future, in the present? Is it talking about Bratislava, if it's talking about Dublin? Uh, so basically, extracting information, processing it, and then the other part is about generation. So once you've got all this knowledge, uh, you process it in yourself, and 
either you answer a question or you ask a question, state your opinion. So these are two broadly classified uh, applications of natural language processing. <clears throat> and how do we achieve that in uh, technical terms? Uh, there's tokenization, uh, which is, so um, when you understand language, when you, when you uh, learn to speak or read a new language, you start from the words. You start, or even before that, you look at the characters. So when I look at uh, Slovakian texts and English texts, the accents come right in there. So I understand that characters are different. I understand that the words are different. So I understand that the, a, a whole sentence will be completely illegible to me. Um, but then it's me as a human breaking down that whole knowledge of how I understand the language into smaller parts. So tokenization is also the same thing, uh, breaking down a whole sentence, uh, a whole piece of text into smaller parts. Characters, do you want to look at characters? Do you want to look at words? Do you want to look at a whole sentence? Or do you want to look at a whole chapter? Uh, it depends on what you're trying to solve. So I'm going to be using this a lot because there's nothing standardized in the realm of NLP. You have to design it yourself depending on what kind of text or what kind of uh, discourse that you have in your hand. So terminology, um, I'll be using text, discourse, uh, corpus, interchangeably. Discourse um, is a piece of text that is under analysis in NLP. A corpus is a collection of documents, texts, um, like a data set. So for others, you might call it a data set. For text, it's uh, especially called corpora or a corpus. So in, it depends on a corpus how you will, and your task, how you will go for tokenization or breaking down a whole piece of text into smaller chunks. Normalization is standardizing. So, um, <clears throat> so in English, you have, say, the word playing play, played, They're all, they all mean the same thing. But how do you distinguish it? You have, you have you, the, the most famous ones is stemming, and you basically remove all the suffix or the prefix and keep just the stem or the root word, which is play. That also helps uh, these, these NLP processes, which are based on vocabulary, um, to feed to to process lesser features, so playing, played, play, the three would have been different features. Whereas if you use normalization, you will only be using one instead of the various forms. And uh, the other thing would be to speed up computation, and um, and then basically letting the machine know that all these three or four different variations of the same word they actually mean the same thing about the same thing. So that's normalization, stop words removal, removing the things that are not, uh, that do not convey a lot of information. Um, when you do, so for example, and, or, in the, the prepositions, the articles, they do not contain a lot of, lot of um, information. They are used in the syntax, sometimes, like not, if you're, if you're solving a sentiment analysis problem, not is a heavily used word, which probably does not have a lot of uh, information in uh, stop word removal uh, language. But then for that particular task, having uh, retaining the information about not is very important. Um, if, you're, if you're processing technical documents, right? So and, or, these are gates, right, for us. And and or, they provide important information. But then if you look at the general stop word uh, removal list, and and or, you will definitely find it. But it depends on what you're solving again to define the list of stop words, the words that, that occur a lot of times in a corpus, but it's not the most, uh, and they do not, but they do not convey a lot of information. So you basically need to remove it. That also reduces the number of features down of your, if it's a vocabulary-based um, corpus, I mean, sorry, if it's a vocabulary-based um, text processing technique, it'll reduce a lot of overhead for the machine as well. It will reduce the number of features because the number of features is equivalent to the vocabulary set that you define. Um, 
Uh, the fourth one is letter case. So if it's a capital letter, if it's a small letter, we usually go for lower cases. Uh, but then in some um, applications, like if you're identifying an entity, um, capital letters of the first word, of the, the capital letter of the word, first letter, is important to convey the information that is, it is about an entity, it is a proper noun. So you want to preserve it or not, it depends on, again, what task you're solving. So the letter case, the punctuations, um, punctuations sometimes could be noise, sometimes could not be noise. The case when it could not be noise is uh, social media. So we'll look at it later on, but traditionally, we, uh, we, are, we remove the punctuations. And then <coughs> there, I've listed down three f information extraction uh, techniques, parts of speech, so uh, the sentence syntax. Um, so, um, so understanding what is the part of speech, is it, is it a verb, it is, an, is it a noun, is it an adjective, is it describing something, um, <clears throat> is it an adverb, is it a conjunction, so what, what is that, what is the syntax of the, of the statement that you're processing? Um, entity recognition is about understanding if it's um, talking about a particular person or a thing or an organization. Advanced parsers, entity recognizers, they also uh, identify date, they identify currencies, they identify, um, what else, um, the different, uh, different kinds of organizations. Um, it identifies sports, it identifies um, whatever data you train, train that entity recognizer on. And, and it basically extracts all those information um, and presents it to the machine to understand, uh, to identify what this you know, text is about or about whom is this text written about. And topic modeling is basically grouping different texts together and give it a topic uh, that say these hundred texts are about this, this maybe politics or these few texts are about sports. It's used in a lot in, in news uh, websites for categorizing news text in uh, what topic they belong to. And I've just listed three, there are more. Um, <clears throat> and we'll, we'll see some of those um, in the social media analysis part. Um, so we start with the social media part of it after the primer on natural language processing. Uh, <clears throat> why social media? Social media is the thing of this generation. Uh, it's like, it's 15 years old, it's like a teenager, always data coming in, huge volume, real-time uh, data, and loads of variety. So it, it satisfies the three Vs of big data, right? Um, it's got, it, the data is increasing every second. There are vari the different varieties of social media uh, platforms as well. And the, and the best thing about this is when traditional NLP would be processed on books, uh, textbooks, reports, news, printed media, uh, they're all very skillfully written down. They're very thoughtfully written down text, whereas social media is not that carefully crafted piece of text. They are very conversational, grounded data, and it also gives you a lot of metadata along with, uh, with, with a particular text, like where this, um, this text was posted from, um, what is the reception of a particular text written in the social media. So what's the interaction like? How many likes were there? How many comments were there? So you also understand the sentiment associated with it. So it is a two-way street. You understand how people perceive uh, whatever has been put out on social media. So <clears throat> that's the advantage. So you understand how you, so, so there's a lot of scope of understanding we what the general multitude thinks. Um, <clears throat> so different types of social media could, could be uh, categorized as social networks, um, like Facebook, blogs, microblogs, like Quora, uh, you have, uh, you have um, Stack Overflow, like discussion forums, you've got social bookmarks like Pinterest, Wiki Wikipedia projects, which is crowdsourced um, from users, you've got social news, 
and you've got um, media sharing as well, like Instagram, you've got TikTok. Um, <clears throat> and, and all of these uh, social media platforms, if you think about it, and if you want to engineer all this data into one, one platform, it's, it's going to be very difficult because you've got all different metrics of measuring, for example. Some of the websites will have likes. Some of the uh, websites will have different kinds of reactions. The different kinds of reactions will also be like maybe three. You can give maybe three reactions. You could give maybe five reactions. It's difficult to standardize it. And, <clears throat> and then you could have subscribers. You could have followers. You could have connections. They have different. Th these platforms are differently designed, so putting, putting them all together is, uh, is a difficult task. The application of social media analysis, now if you can understand uh, the sentiment of the general multitude, would be very, very important for every business. So across all industry, you, uh, industries, you have business intelligence, you have, <coughs> you have uh, people uh, people sitting there working as uh, digital analysts who want to uh, look at how a product launch, launch has been received by the consumers. What are the consumers or your clients talking about in the, in the social media? Uh, was it good? Was it bad? Feedback, all these things, anal an analysis. And all industries have recruitment. So nowadays, recruitments or recruiters, they um, use um, automated keyword detection techniques, um, <clears throat> which is also aided by natural language processing or text analytics. They extract information about um, these people who have applied for a job, and they match these keywords with the job description, and they, they uh, get a report out of it to select whose, whose profile matches very well with the job description. <clears throat> In healthcare, massively, because you get um, this kind of data where people put out their sentiment, their emotion out of it. Um, and then you can, you, can <clears throat> you can detect different kinds of mental health issues in, um, in people. Uh, there have been use cases, uh, studies about suicide um, detection, suicidal nature detection over there. Um, <clears throat> and then there, there are some companies that are working on chatbots, which are aided for, for helping people who want uh, instant counseling. Um, defense and security, uh, if you've heard about dark web, this dark web monitoring as well for uh, security, um, for, um, for, under, for detecting events which, are, um, which could be aided by terrorists, um, <clears throat> and uh, media journalism and social news, uh, where um, a lot of, lot of today's news are actually crowdsourced. Uh, from social media networks. So if, if one, one particular company posts about it, the next company or the next journalist who keeps a track of all these news coming in, in real time, that person posts, posts it from there. Uh, automatic summarization also builds a summary of the whole, of, of a whole news and then puts out in there. So they're all NLP text analytics uh, applications in marketing as well, finance, um, to build chatbots to help manage your finances, um, <clears throat> to to predict stock markets. Uh, my thesis was on um, on the application of NLP, extracting sentiment, uh, analyzing that and correlating that with stock markets, and then um, and understanding how much how much correlation it has. Is it significant or not? Uh, so it's an interesting area in politics as well um, and in, um, in managing disasters. So real-time people post on social media saying that I'm safe. They mark themselves safe. So if in an occurrence of an event, there, these, these topics, they go in trend. So keyword extraction, there's top, topic modeling, and also understanding user engagement and detecting these kind of these, um, the sporadic events um, and spotting them on social media, these are all uh, a type of text analytics uh, techniques. And <coughs> NLP is hard. NLP is hard because you don't know how to segment your text. You don't know if you want to work with characters or words or sentences. Idioms and phrases could be confusing to the machines. So what does happiness is a piece of cake mean when you have a vocabulary where it doesn't follow 
this um, this standard syntax. So when you have when you when you get all vocabulary in an NLP traditional NLP system, uh, happiness is an a uh, there there uh, an article and a preposition um, article and uh, a verb. So these are stop words. Remove them. All you're left with is happiness, peace, and cake. What would a machine understand from happiness, peace, and cake? Are they related to each other? Uh, it's difficult to express to the machine uh, for us to encode as well. Same, same goes with the, with, the, with the other examples. So it's confusing with the synonyms as well. So if you've um, words that have um, same meanings, uh, but they're spelled differently. Homonyms are the ones that they're spelled same, but they mean different, um, uh, and but they mean differently. And homophones are when they they sound the same, but they're they're two different spellings that mean two different things. So homophones are especially problematic for speech recognition systems. Um, but then all these things they they are pretty much um, good for confusing a machine, which us humans are trained to understand from scratch. And then you would need to know a word knowledge. So the famous question, who is the spouse of Barack Obama? If you've studied uh, NLP systems or have you know, listened to other talks, they ask this question. And uh, if, if a machine doesn't know who Barack Obama is, will not be able to tell you who the spouse is. So, you need to have world knowledge. You need to know that Bratislava is the capital of Slovakia. So um, you need to you need to uh, train these models on millions and millions of data where you know transformers are today, and uh, <clears throat> multiple languages which with diverse syntax in social media. It's it's quite common. Um, and then contractions. So when I say I I have is contracted into I've. Um, I've had um, VR is W E apostrophe R E VR VR, um, and then these contractions again they mean the same thing, but then you have to normalize them into something that is standard to a whole piece of text. So how do we, how do you want to uh, handle the uh, contractions? Uh, it's difficult because um, in uh, you need to define a dictionary, there could be different kinds, different varieties of it, define a logic for it. So NLP is hard, but it wasn't as hard if it, if it were we're looking at for text, because they're, you assume that they're grammatically correct, the syntax is standard, uh, it's monolingual, so traditionally we would write text in a single language, um, correct spellings, uh, and then it uses a prop pretty much formal language. So there's not many deviations and not much noise, so it's easier to process this, um, the, the traditional text. But with what happens with social media is you've got informal language. Uh, it's hard to tokenize then. Uh, what is the definition of word? There are m multiple words clubbed together in hashtags. Uh, there are inconsistencies with punctuations, lots of dots and a lot of exclamations, a lot of question marks and exclamations clubbed together. Uh, spell characters, typos everywhere. The vocabulary is diverse. Um, neologism stands for uh, different words, um, the, the words that the, the users, they just coin something new and they, they start writing about it. So those, so stemming and traditional lemmatization techniques, they won't work. And then phonetic spelling, so like parte, P-A-R-T-A-Y, which is, which is incorrect. So how do you want to process them? So diverse vocabulary, new way of, new way of expression, so hashtags, emoticons, entity names. You want to keep them all because they have information. They're not noise. Um, and then uh, text embedded media. So you've got all all these memes and uh, motivational images. We've got text written in them. How would you want to process them? Transliteration, uh, multiple languages in one particular text. There and they're not just like different languages together in one piece of text, but then two different languages merged in one particular word. How do you want to separate them? And 
different platform, different parser, like I already said, um, different platforms have different strategies of uh, engagement, pulling more people into those platforms and encouraging people to interact with each other. So <clears throat> they're different platforms, so, it's, so it just becomes a tad bit harder uh, than the traditional NLP. So the noise content in formal text was very less and in social media, it has gone high up, but that noise also contains a lot of information, and it's going to be, and it is tricky to, to, to segregate those. And recall this is how our, our, our presentation looked when we talked about normal, nat traditional natural language understanding techniques. And this is how the next one looks for social media you need to select an appropriate tokenizer. You need to look at what stopwatch you want to use. You want to remove all the noise. So if you want to remove the accents, emoticons, HTML tags, if you've got a rest use from scraping those, you need to handle the contractions. You need to go for a spelling check before you, you go for processing those texts. You need to detect language and you got to translate them depending on how much, uh, how much uh, other language do you have in that corpus because if you're scraping, sometimes you can, you, can, um, you can specify what language you want the text in. But if you've got like a less content, content of you know, some other language, you, can, you could remove it. But if it's like maybe about 40% of some other language and 50% of the target language, you would prefer to, um, prefer to translate them and keep those information in your corpus. Um, handle letter cases. Um, we've already talked about that. Normalization, same. Stemming and limitation, but it just becomes a bit more difficult when it comes to uh, social media. Handle punctuations, because uh, a lot of punctuations, they convey a lot of stronger sentiment. Uh, so how do you want to handle that? Um, people, people do use uh, punctuation counters as well um, in, um, in, in these kind of text processing tasks um, and also handle tags, so handling hashtags, account tags, uh, the new words that has been generated on social media. So all these things, they come under the data cleaning and pre-processing uh, step, which is the first step um, of natural language understanding. And NLP tasks for social media. So once you've done all your cleaning and data preparation, what NLP tasks could you work on for your social media analysis? So first and foremost, we have classification and clustering, which are which which constitutes the basic of many of the uh, tasks that has been noted below it. Um, classification stands for attributing a particular text into a predefined class or a label. And clustering uh, is done when you do not have an accompanying label. If you don't, do not have an accompanying uh, class, uh, you want to put all similar uh, text together in a bunch. So sorting in different hats. And, uh, and, and classification and clustering could be used for behavioral analysis, for customer segmentation. So what is the pattern of purchase for a particular customer or a particular group of customers? Can I retain it uh, with any change in my business? Uh, can, or, or how can I lure in newer customers? Uh, even detection, you've got user modeling. It's similar to customer segmentation, but um, for um, for markets which are not in, you know, not in pretty much marketing. And then uh, topic modeling, uh, topic modeling, again, segregating all them, uh, the similar text together based on what topics you've given, uh, trends identification in social media, and opinion mining, sentiment, emotion, sarcasm, especially in healthcare applications, this is, um, this is important, and also sarcasm. It's, um, it's, it's one of the most researched areas in social media analysis. Got information extraction, exactly those that we had uh, talked about in our previous slide, and uh, language identification and translation forms a big part. It's, it's a very complicated process. Text summarization, so you must have seen um, nowadays 
any article, not just news organizations, any articles, uh, many of the blogging websites have introduced this little summary on top of it. So it automatically goes, checks this longer articles and puts out a summary at the top for people to use. Um, and then content filtering uh, to create social media a safer place and uh, acceptable place for everyone. Um, um, to filter hate speech, violence, harassment, to detect and discard spams and scams, inappropriate content not suitable for people, and rumor detection to filter out the fa fake news that are uh, rampant in social media nowadays. And that kind of comes um, to the uh, to the end of the 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 presentation. So in, in conclusion, in summary, um, social media has gained a lot of focus uh, to the availability of rich, rich and real-time kaleidoscopic data. And I mean to say that it's not just the text got a lot of metadata which is associated with it. It's not just plain simple text uh, as compared to what you used to get in, in our traditional corpuses where you got just the maybe the author name and the and the and the and the topic name, the heading, but but not but not uh, other details in, along with it. Uh, one of the difficult part here we did not discuss yet is that data is available uh, all throughout social media, but annotating that data is tedious. Getting those labels are tedious, um, and finding the relevant content is tedious. So I've read this research on this um, suicide detection article, and this guy was talking about how only about 5% of the entire data that they had scraped was about uh, suicides. So when, you're, when, you are, um, when you are working on a text classification or any kind of classification algorithm, you might have heard about imbalanced data sets. So your data set is highly imbalanced. You've got only 5% of your target class or something that you want to predict, and you've got other millions of record of things that are not relevant. So what is the machine going to learn from? Uh, so that severe, uh, that, that this, is an, this is a crucial problem for uh, social media analysis. You've got data everywhere, but you need annotations along with it to be able to train the machines and say that you know, this particular text means that. Um, <clears throat> it's also a great process for mental health studies and behavioral analytics. Um, and not everything in machine learning model, they're, they're not, uh, everything is not uh, machine learning here. So a lot of these things are also rule-based. Uh, uh, for example, we use a lot of regex in NLP uh, to extract information. So, these, so it's not just machine learning, it comes under the hood of AI and defining your custom algorithms, defining your own pipeline. So, it goes into the next point, no standard way of analyzing text data. So you have to design your pipeline the way you want to deal with the problem. There's, there's, there's no, no standard way of saying like, you have to do a tokenizer first and then you have to go for a normalizer, then you have to handle lowercase or uppercase. Um, you have to design your own way of things. What, what information do you want to extract? So I've been working in one of these projects where I had to go uh, extract these uh, entities first. So for um, entities first, you have to go through uh, named entity recognition models first and then go for tokenizers sometimes. Sometimes you don't even need to tokenize with the latest, uh, with the latest uh, thing in the market in NLP, the transformers, they give you auto tokenizers. You just have to feed in your text. Um, but then if you need some information uh, from those texts, or if you want to particularly want the model to focus on something, you will have to prob probably design your own pipeline to it. So there's no standard way. Uh, you have to look at your uh, data, look at your task, um, what sort of data is available, and clean it and build your own pipeline. Uh, you will find the resources for this talk. So I was um, a bit concerned about how long this talk is going to be. Um, there, so uh, I did not plan for a demo, but if you want to go through a sample code, it's there. Um, um, in the second and third point, I do have uh, a blog written about it, and you'll find the slides on my GitHub. Links are there. Um, 
and then some references that I'd used, and there's some useful Python libraries if you want to explore more about NLP. So NLTK is uh, the most uh, popular Python library that helps you uh, do most, most of the data cleaning, pre-processing, machine learning tasks, and uh, you can use Pacey, which is, uh, for which you don't really have to club it with sklearn uh, for machine learning. It's it's um, it has got everything all together. It's it's also a nice library. I haven't worked much with it. Uh, Gensim is was particularly developed for topic modeling. So if you want to explore topic modeling, you probably will find many articles uh, which uses the Gensim's uh, topic modeling uh, algorithms. Then Pattern, so I recently discovered Pattern. It's a really uh, cool uh, library which, uh, which doesn't really require you to uh, register on Twitter uh, or the Tutor Developer AI. You don't need to have your API keys and everything. This, this library does it for, us, for you. And uh, you can get in data like the tweet text. You'll get um, the time when it was posted. You'll get um, what language, so you can filter which language it was, um, which language uh, tweets do you want in your corpus, etc. And then tweet NLP again. It's another it's another Python library which allows you to um, scrape which, uh, to get and uh, uh, process text um, or tweets. So yeah, that's all. I think I have um, some time left. If you have any questions. Um, yeah, sure, we have questions. Uh, an average person is quite bad at recognizing sarcasms uh, in a written form in online discussions. Can AI do better? I don't think there has been, you know, any better models for that. I don't think so. Yeah, okay. Uh, let me remind you to ask questions in Slido, right? Okay, the next question is, are emojis noises? In the context of social media, they seem to be important. Is it difficult to work with emojis in NLP models? It depends on what you're working on. So if you're working on sentiment analysis uh, or emotional uh, analysis problem statements, you cannot discard emoticons over there. But you probably will need to maybe uh, use a proxy word for it, for the machine learning model to be able to make sense out of it. Yeah. So currently, emotions aren't real important, like useful information. It, it, it is. It is. It conveys some information. and uh, Yeah, but uh, AI couldn't right now recognize it, right? Sorry? Like AI couldn't understand the emoji at all, right? Um, well, it can and cannot. Well, the, the transformers, they can. But the other traditional ways of doing NLP, they, they probably wouldn't be able to do it themselves unless you tell the machine explicitly that we are dealing with emoticons and you have to process it in this particular way. Okay, thanks. And the other questions. Uh, how to get Facebook data from publicly available Facebook groups, pages for text analysis? I am not sure about Facebook data. I, I know about Twitter. Uh, I tried to search for it, but I didn't get any any corpus about it. I think it's some, it has something to do with privacy um, and uh, the legal issues, maybe for scraping data. I'm not sure. Okay, so that was the all questions. Thank you for your time and no yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.